How closely have you ever studied a typical backyard snowflake? These photos were made in the backyard of Don Camarecha. Just look at the complex molecular symmetry. I believe that you know that the structure is unique in every separate snowflake. There are no two alike ever through history or anywhere in the world. And I think you also know that when crystals like these fall in large enough numbers in deceptively quiet winter storm events, they can be deadly. They can kill livestock. These beautiful tiny things can also kill people who don't know the power of winter weather. Snowflakes are cold. Snowflakes are heavy. They can gather together with enough weight to break power lines. And these silent winter storms can freeze and break water lines. Now, of course, it's easy for American men to ignore these risks because the risks are mathematically small. The risks have been made mathematically small by a century of responsible planning and work and foresight. Our municipalities can usually fix winter damage pretty quickly. And so we've been going through life depending on centralized administrative systems and low paid bureaucrats. But how smart is that? We coast along enjoying all the modern safety nets, which we tend to think are interwoven with the same grand complexity of a crystallized snowflake. But the reality is just the opposite. As Texans discovered this week in a, a different kind of complexity, they saw what it looked like when a different kind of storm landed on them. And disasters can be interwoven as Judge Hidalgo noted. What she said just this week about the storm that crashed into them was that the the cascading effects are not going to go away. The cascading effects are not going to go away. The first day was hard, the second day was harder, the third day was harder, and it continues to get harder. So what can we learn from Texas? They were reduced this week, you know, all over the state to third world conditions within about 48 hours of the storm hitting them. Up to 15 million Texans were without heat and electricity as temperatures across the state dropped to below freezing. Just this, just this week, 30 have died so far that we know of, and the disasters within disasters continue to be seen and noticed and measured. Now, one trigger at the very beginning was the failure of the men in the state's energy divisions. There was equipment in some nuclear power plants in Texas, which was not hardened for extreme cold weather. And so they had to shut it down as the storm began to approach. And one official said uh, in his defense, there was, there was never a need for this. And so what do we say? Well, he was wrong. He failed in his leadership duties. He failed to see the need that there was a need to harden nuclear power plants in Texas. And we have to say this, that um, Millions of other men also failed, who right now, this week, cannot keep their families warm in their own homes. So let's talk about the lessons here. The risks of death from hypothermia and hunger and dehydration are there. They're low, but they are not zero. And more snowflakes are predicted to fall tonight. And for you men who have family, friends, or neighbors who depend on you to soften the hardships of life, I have a question for you about character, about your character. Do you have the character of a leader? And how serious are you about life-saving resiliency? To what extent are you directly dependable? Or do you just tend to tell your family, friends, and neighbors to depend on somebody else, to depend on the government to keep them warm and alive and adequately fed? Are you among those men who are so conceited about modern conveniences that you delude yourself that you slip into denial about direct risks and dangers. Just this afternoon, there are, there are Texans driving around on near empty gas tanks, looking for homes, any home that might have heat. And then they go to the door and they beg to be able to drop off their children to stay warm so they don't freeze to death tonight. And when they knock on the door, they usually find that there are a whole lot of other children who've already been dropped off in these homes. This is how they're living right now. I talked to a friend of mine just this afternoon on the phone. He doesn't have water, hasn't had water all week. He does have power. His company is shut down because there's not enough power to, to, to run it. 
There is power getting coming back online for some of the grocery stores, but they can only stay open for just a few hours. And by the time they shut down, the, the shelves are cleaned out. And so if we expect to live in a world with no risk, we are indulging ourselves in a grossly irresponsible way of thinking, and it's a pattern that has to be broken. And just because we've been taught to expect to live in a system which pampers us and, and caters to our conceits and our delusions, it, this doesn't mean that we can keep going. We, we have to break the cycle. And so my challenge to men on this channel is to just stop being so dependent on others to do the thinking and planning and providing and all the work. This is a feeble hope. And my challenge to you men is, is this. You've got to develop the disciplines to do hard things for your family and community so that they are not ambushed by hardship. And now, okay, so what would that look like in your relationship to a typical winter snowstorm, a typical winter snowfall? Let's talk about that. You would face the potential threats honestly and you would take steps to reduce those threats to zero or, or as close to zero as you possibly could. And, and of course, this starts with thinking through the possibilities. What could happen? What could happen you know, at the top, hop, top of the chain of power? Now, how far ahead do you think you can think? And, and how far down could you think to the right into your homes and neighborhoods? Could Arctic conditions hit your, your neighborhood as they did in South Texas? Uh, if your city water supply was frozen or broken and not repairable for months, where would you get clean water? especially if the roads were also out of service and there was no municipal power to run any well pumps in your county. Well, you would, you would of course, fall back on your, your backup plan, your stored water supply, your filters that you'd have so that you could draw water from dirty mud puddles and drink it and not get sick. And if you didn't have those things, what would happen? Well, you would honestly likely die from dehydration or cholera or dysentery. And if, in thinking about this, yeah, this is hard to think about, and it's frustrating to think about. But if, you're, if your main response is just to blow it off and ha have a childish solution and just say, look, what's the big deal? We could just all go outside and eat some snow to stay hydrated. You're not thinking like a leader if you think that way. You're not living in the real world. Did you know you'd ha you would have to consume gallons of snow simply to get the hydration level of one glass of water? You would be driving your body temperatures down so far, so fast, with every bite of a snowball that you were, you were eating to try to stay hydrated, you would fail. It would be a fail. And on top of that, you'd be consuming toxins if you tried to do that with snow. From our poisoned atmosphere, which, which are picked up by the snowflakes that fall down uh, on your house. Now, what if your house depends on municipal power or municipal gas for warmth and, and both were totally unavailable for many weeks. What kind of backup have you put in place ahead of time because of your ability to think and plan and act and work hard and become a little bit more independent? I think you know a small wood stove could keep your household alive, but you will have to, it'll take some work to find one and put it into place, get it safely installed, and then it will take some work to get some wood for it, dry fuel, wood which you will have had put under cover to dry out before winter comes. What I have taught my sons is that you need to try to get your winter wood supply put under cover by the 4th of July because it'll take that long for it to dry out. And you need to be working on that when nobody else is thinking about firewood and snowstorms and hypothermia, but you are because you're thinking ahead. So, so men, uh, we have to admit, we have lost most of the basic disciplines needed to lead our families in time of hardship. Now, our great-grandparents had it. We, we, we've lost it. Now, the way forward is to begin think to regain this. The way forward is to begin thinking in terms of freedom. And this is my message for this video. Think in terms of freedom. Freedom from dependency. Freedom from habits of childish escapism. Freedom from deadly threats, freedom from the stupidity that says, hey, there's no need to winterize my way of life because um, I'll be taken care of by the government. They'll save me. Don't think that way anymore. Sound and responsible thinking 
was the basic orientation of the fathers who raised families in America long before there were any utilities. And they taught their sons how to think like free men. Now, I want to show you a book that illustrates what I'm, I'm trying to say. It's in my library. I want to go in and sit by the fire and open this book up and show it to you. It's got pictures. You, you really do want to see it. Um, as I move in there, please take a moment to subscribe, like this video, share it with men. I think you know men who would benefit from being challenged by what's in this video. So share it, stand by, I'll be with you in a second. Okay, my second is up, but I've got the book, and this, this is the book that I, I want to show you. It's written by the historian Eric Sloan, who was a great explorer in all over the United States. And one day in the 20th century, mid 20th century, he was exploring an abandoned uh, house up in, the, in Connecticut. And here's what he found. This is his sketch. He's a, he's a good artist, as we'll see. A little sketch of a leather-bound booklet, which turned out to be a diary, the diary of a young boy, an early American boy, and his adventures working with his father, working with his family to try to, try to build a homestead that was completely free and independent. And they, they really did succeed. But we see from day to day, hour to hour, what he did. It's a record of what he did, how he thought, the things that he was taught. And it's a remarkable record of not just one boy, but the kind of culture that was instilling in young men and women a vision for freedom and how to think like free people. So let's walk through this and let me, let me show you a little bit about what he discovered when he began looking into the diary. This is his first sketch of it, the diary uh, closed and tied open. And this is Noah Blake's little inkwell that he had. And there is fortunately a photograph of it, of the inkwell and the diary. And there was an almanac that happened to be with it uh, in that old abandoned house that Eric Sloan was exploring. And so let me tell you about this, the homestead that that Noah Blake and his father and mother were building. And in the bitter cold Connecticut winters, they were fine. This, they've been here on their homestead now for several years, we can see, and it's, winter is raging, and they're doing just fine. Here's Noah, Noah this, and this is Eric Sloan's drawing and his imagination of what it looked like. Now they, they can see and they know by the foundations of the buildings that still existed what was here on the farm. And from the from the very detailed notes in the diary, the kinds of things that they did when they were building, for example, this is the sluice way from the mill pond that they had to construct down to the water wheel, which they built, and then the mill, which served the growing community there. And then they actually built this bridge, a covered bridge by themselves with their axes so that people could come from the village, the village is down this direction, and around to the other farming areas farther away. This is the barn, which is not finished. They've simply built the foundation knowing that at some point they would have fields and hay fields and corn fields and things and animals that they would need to put in the barn and it would be very tall. Um, and they put a roof over what they had and began using it without animals. Here's the father walking uh, with water uh, to from the pond to the animals, to water the animals. So we can see Noah and this is his friend Sarah, whom he will later marry, and we can see some of the drama of that story in his diary from the day that he first met her to the day that they were engaged. And so um, this is wintertime. Um, they're secure because they've been so free, they don't depend on anything. There are no utilities. They have everything they need. They have, they have fire, uh, wood for the fires in the mill, wood for the fire in their home, in their cabin that they've done. Here's, here's one entry on the 26th particular month. A light snow fell, which Father believes will be the last of the winter. We felled a fine oak and rolled it upon rails for spring seasoning, so it has to dry out straight. It has to dry out straight. Mother is joyous at the thought of a good wood floor, because what do they have in their cabin? They have a dirt floor. I mean, they've just, they have to build things very slowly as they go, because they're building everything that they have by themselves. And here is Eric Sloan's sketch of what we know about their cabin. Uh, before it had a wood floor, it had a dirt floor. And here's Rachel, the mom, um, doing something that many mothers did. 
they, they kept their house clean. They kept it orderly, and they kept it aesthetically artistic and beautiful. And here she is carving a floral design in the, in the dirt floor that she has smoothed out. The people are, yes, they're going to walk on. They're going to mess it up. But at least when they come in, they see this is, this is really a nice, wonderful, artistic, aesthetic place to grow up and to be and to visit. And they did actually have quite a bit of company, we can tell from the diaries. But these are some of the things that they built. They had to build their tables. And again, um, very, very few nails uh, were available. They used um, pegs, wooden pegs, to hold things together, and they had learned how to do that in and, and building a really good, solid, secure door. Um, closets um, didn't exist yet, but they did have chests that they had where they kept important belongings. They And the, these are the tools of the mother's domain, her cooking, and what she's doing. Here's a firewood box full of firewood, uh, properly dried and ready to be used, so the mother's not having to su suffer this effects of smoke when she cooks for the family. But this, we, we get begin to get the look at a free family, a family who probably would, would never be seeing any government agents their whole life unless it was a postman or a postal writer. So in the book, Eric Sloan is fascinated by how they were able to build, just with their bare hands, everything that they needed from the land. They had dirt for agriculture. They had trees. They had stones, and that's almost all they had. They could get scraps of metal. They could get iron. Now, they didn't smelt their own iron. I'm not sure where they got the scraps of iron, but they built one of the first things they had to build was this little forge. And here is his sketch of what the forge would have looked like on the inside. Really hot fire, a bellows that Noah is pumping so that the oxygen is making it as hot as possible, hot enough to melt iron. And so, and the father is building a tool that they need. All the tools that they used, they built themselves. And so, through the book, as we learn about the tools that they had, we see pictures of them. Eric Sloan is fascinated by what they were able to build, and he documents what it, what it is, the different kinds of axes that they needed to fell trees and then carve, the different ways that they would split logs to come up with boards like for the boards for the floor that they're going to build for, for the mother. What kinds of tools they could, this is a tool built from wood. And it's a, it's a really pe solid piece of hardwood with a wood handle, and it's used, it's called a beetle, and, and it is the, the mallet that's used to drive in these stakes. So uh, early on, the old Indian trail, um, which leads through their farmstead and crosses the river, they fortified with a, just a log bridge, a very simple log bridge. But they have designs that they want to build a real bridge, big enough and strong enough and permanent enough so that traffic can go over it for years and years and years. So right now, here's what they're doing is gathering stones that they have on the farm and building an abutment for the, for, for the bridge using Daniel, the ox, and, and there's, a lot of, there's a lot in Noah's diary about his friend Daniel, the ox. He works with him all day. Daniel was uh, raised up from a very young calf uh, to be obedient, and that's, what really, that's really all a, an ox is, a male calf who is trained and gentle so that he knows certain commands. Go and stop and turn left and turn right. Now, those weren't the words that they used for, for Daniel the ox. They had their own vocabulary and commands for him, but look what he's doing. He's pulling just a little bit on a lever. Here's the fulcrum, moving the stone that's too heavy for them to li lift into place to be part of the abutment for the bridge. This, it really is fascinating to see all that they did. And here is the design for the, for the bridge that uh, they're, they're building at this point that will hold up <clears throat> the floor of the bridge and then later they'll build walls and a roof over it so that the weather will not destroy the work of their hands as quickly as it might if it was exposed to the elements. But let, I, I want to show you this sketch, uh, which is really fascinating, and this is part, part of the story. They had a vision for what they wanted to do. This is a sketch of their farmstead, their homestead that they were building early in, in 1790. This is a picture of what it looked like in 1790. This is the first home that they had, the log cabin. And it was sturdy enough to suit them for 
for many years. And we will see through the diary what happened over the next 15 years as Noah was born and had a little room right here in this little lean-to, later had a window, an actual glass window that they put. But here you can see, this is the old Indian trail way up here. This is a, a garden uh, for the, the kitchen garden that they have. These are stumps from the forest that they're clearing to, to actually be able to build their farm. More stumps out in the field for the agricultural projects that they will do. More forest over here, which became their cornfield later. And then here are the stone foundations of the early barn that they built, which you'll see in the, in the next drawing 15 years later and what it does look like. Again, I told you about the forge. The forge was built down here near where they want to build the mill. And if you can see the topography, the, you know, the lowest part here is the creek. It comes up the hill, it goes up. There's a, there's a little mountain range back here behind them where they, where they planted their, for, their forest, uh, their, the wood that they wanted to serve as timber for them down the road in the future, way down the road in the future one generation, two generations, three generations down the future. But look at all the rocks that you can see here that they have to work with. And they're planning to use this foundation of these stones and build up the foundation for the mill, which will be erected here. This is the site of the new bridge that they built. And we'll, we'll see, that. Let's, so let's look now at the, the place 15 years later in 1805. The barn has taken shape now as a, as a massively big barn for all that God has really blessed them with. Look at the, the, the cornfield now, which is, takes the place of the forest that was there. Another field here, a stone fence here from fields that were cleared of stone. And in this family, they, they don't have 14 children like many farm, farm families did. Um, really all they have is Noah that we know of. And then uh, later on his wife Sarah uh, contributed to the, the building up of, of the place. But here's the tool shed and some of the things that they used. A stone boat, which is a, a just really a, a sleigh for pulling stones out of the field and taking them over to the fence where they would uh, erect the stone fence. They built wooden fences. Everything that they, they built from the wood that was available to them, here's the stand of uncut timber that they will be pulling from for future building projects. And, um, and here's where the creek comes into the picture, which they, the power of which they harnessed by building a little dam here and a mill pond. And here's the spillway. It goes over and down into the original bed of the, of the creek. And presumably this is Noah fishing in the creek right here. And then the stream comes down and we can see it, it flows under the covered bridge that they built. And this is what it looks like finished. Uh, two guard, guard rails here, walls for the, to keep the weather off the major beams, a shingle roof, um, a shingle roof for the house too, a shingle roof for the, for the mill. And even it even has a glass window with shutters. So from the mill pond, uh, the water runs down a sluiceway, which is an aqueduct that's built of what? Wood. And it's, it doesn't leak. You know, there's a gate that allows the water to come through, turning, turning on the mill, mill wheel, which turns the works that they built on the inside to grind the wheat for themselves and then the corn and any other kind of grain that they, they have. And they allow the people from the village to come through and do it. Now, this little toll house... Um, I really would like to show you the, um, this is a way that they can make a little bit of extra money uh, for the farm and to be able to purchase things that they cannot make themselves. And so here is a, is a picture of the, uh, of the charges for the toll. And here's the toll house, there's a little bell. You're supposed to ring the bell if you drive up and they're out in the fields working and they'll come over and try to help you and, uh, and receive your toll. Foot passengers, one cent. Horned cattle, three cents. Now, D-O means ditto. So that's uh, just so you know, that's what that means. Horse, jack, or mule, three cents. A wheel carriage, 10 cents. A burden cart or wa a wagon, six cents. Steeds or sleighs, six, six cents. And if you're doing business with the mill, nothing. You, don't, you, you pay nothing. You're coming to the mill. 
you'll be doing business with a mill, you'll be paying something for that so you don't have to pay anything to cross the bridge going either direction. Now look at this, Sabbath day passage, uh, nothing. You don't pay, they don't collect money on the Sabbath for this. And these, these little things that we learn from, from the diary about what life was like and what they did, what they didn't do, and what traditions they might have had and what traditions they, they might have been building. Here's, here's a shot of the mill in progress as they're building it. And it starts with a foundation, a really good, strong, firm foundation, which is one of the things that took the longest to do, we know from the diary. And, how you, and then how you build a water wheel, how you build the axle for it, so that it can literally reach inside the mill and power all the machinery that will be made. The cutting of the rafters from logs, choosing of the logs for the right rafters, and, and logs and the foundations and the beams. And here's the sluice way, uh, engineered, to have exactly the right amount of fall so that it would come right to the place where it needs to be driving down, this is an overshot sluice, driving down the water wheel to power it uh, with water and gravity, gravity and water. And they harnessed all the powers that they could of, of nature in the summer and the winter and everything that was available to them. One in interesting entry Pine wood cuts beautifully, and, and Noah, of co course, growing up, would know about every different kind of wood and species of wood because they would use different kinds for different things in the home, in the shop, on the farm. We took the day off on the 14th. General Washington died this day six years ago. We could hear a cannon salute all the way from the village, and Robert told me there was a service held there. Robert is his friend from another family. Um, a cannon salute all the way from the village, and Robert told me there was a service held there at the church building that was there. At Sunday meeting, I came across a biblical verse which I copied and gave to Sarah. I asked her not to open it until she arrived at her room. Now I am very worried about it, he says. So we, we can follow many different personal things about his life. Now most of it was very business-like what the weather was like or what they did that day, what they built that day, what they had trouble with building that day. And it really gives us an, an idea of, of how this young man was trained by his father to build up a life. I mean, Noah's going to inherit all this and then continue building it. And this is what happened all over the American colonies and then the United States of America in the 19th century. Farms got bigger, villages got bigger. Um, new inventions would tie them together like the railroads. And we can see through this book how in this, this century, the 18th century and then the 19th century, how did they live? What did they build for themselves? Uh, these are cider mills that they would, would have used there on the farm. Um, how they work, sometimes he, he has a, a diagram here of the full moon. And they would work, oh here's a full moon, where they're working to actually shingle the mill at night under the light of the full moon, uh, an autumn moon, which uh, November 6, 1805 was a, a very bright moon and they took full advantage of that. Um, not everything was hard work. They, <laughs> they built clever toys um, uh, for children in the area and for, uh, to enjoy with each other and, and it clever, new, it clever little devices, um, a, for example, a pass-through for, for an iron box for hot coals to go into the bedroom from the kitchen on the other side of the wall, on the other side of the brick wall. Corn cribs, um, and this, this book is a, is a treasury of ingenuity and how these people would take dominion. Here's, here's one of the wagons crossing over the bridge before the, before the covered bridge is fully finished and what the wagons looked like. How they, here's how they would predict the weather. They would make weather vanes that they could have in the fields, an open field, or on top of a building, um, often made of, of straw. And often, uh, again, models of their aesthetic, artistic ingenuity, and sometimes, and sometimes humor. So um, how do you cut a tree down? How, how do you turn it into a square beam that's able to be used? These are the kinds of tools that they had to make in the forge to be able to use to do that. So what's the point here? The point is that fathers would pass on to sons ways of, of being, of taking all their gifts, talents, ingenuity, resourcefulness, and developing it 
uh, to the to the greatest, so that they could have productive lives, productive farms, and independent ways of living. Here's how they finally, after they carved all the beams, which are extraordinarily heavy and strong, how did they get them across from abutment to abutment? How did they raise them? How did they secure them in place? Um, here's some people who came out to eat, just either watch or to help, but here they're, they're cheering them on one side after it's completely put in place, totally secure with all the pegs driven in, and some of the support beams are now being knocked away by four men who had come to, had come to help them. So this is the diary of Noah Blake. So what can we learn here? The Blake family were not preppers and they were not survivalists. They were nation builders who prized the free market, individual liberty, and the freedom that they had, that they earned in America. Just a few years previous in the War of Independence, to be independent from government interference in their affairs. That's why they went to war with their home, their home country, Great Britain. So by working hard now as Americans to secure their independence, to, to really get a handle on it permanently, to secure their independence and their safety, they did not need to depend on anyone for the basics of life, and especially government agents. Now, I, I've mentioned earlier that for 300 years, Americans enjoyed unprecedented freedoms. They could live, an average American could live to a great old age without ever seeing a representative of the government, except maybe a postal writer or a postmaster. And so what we learn from this simple diary is that Noah Blake's father was teaching him about these principles of freedom and how to think and act like a free man. And the action has to start with how you think, how to think and act like a free man. Now we Americans can regain those ways of thinking and that kind of confidence by starting to take simple responsibilities for home and community life, right where we are. All of us can do it, no matter how big our family is or even if we're not married yet. Free men can envision freedom and then make provision for freedom.